Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. Let's stand all over this place. Let's sing to the Lord this morning. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost and he dug me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free. seat I need you to help me do something not only do we have them watching from all over the world 
uh, across the street and um, around this city. But we also, uh, due to uh, the high number of guests today, both in this service and the one previously, we have folks in overflow this morning who gave up the convenience of their seat and the intimacy of this room. They're watching via the camera right now. Would you just let them know how much you appreciate your sacrifice? And I want to say thank you because we quite literally have people from multiple states that have driven in. I, I can't even begin to acknowledge all of you. There's just, in, there's just too many. There's too many from too many states. Let me simply say on behalf of this faith family called Fairview, thank you. We're honored that you would make this journey in to help us celebrate and biblically to stand with Israel unapologetically, God's covenant people. Thank you for being a part of this day. Now, I am gonna, I'm going to break my own rule. I'm going to contradict myself for just a moment. And Chris will understand this. I cannot go without saying hello to some very special home folk who I had the privilege of pastoring for many years from Savannah, Tennessee. Will you make welcome these ladies who've driven up to be with us? It's a blessing to have y'all. Make them welcome if you would. I, I wouldn't call her out by name for nothing, but her name's Melody. And um, I remember the night we anointed you and we asked God, to give you the heart, the desire of your heart. And his name is Seth today. And he's a big old tall, good looking boy. I hate him. And uh, <laughs> every time I see him, I'm reminded how God taught me that God still does miracles. Thank you for being a vessel of God's honor. I love you. I love them. God bless you. If you're a guest today um, and you didn't drive uh, from all over the world, uh, come, uh, fill out a guest card. Now, if you did drive in, fill that out too. But if you're looking for a church home, fill that out. Tell Christy and I how to pray for you. We met two beautiful families. That this was their first Sunday. They're looking for a church family. So if you're a guest today, come right out that door right there and uh, go to Connection Point. My wife and I, Christy, have a very special gift for you. We'd love to meet you, pray for you, and say hello. Now, when you came in, you should have, uh, from our hospitality ministry, you should have gotten an olive wood cross. If you do not have one, I'm going to ask you to just, uh, in a moment, step uh, out into the foyer. You're going to need this at the end of the service. I promise you're going to want one of these. And so I encourage you to get a hold of this before you leave this place today. Should have gotten one when you came in. So um, y'all ready to have church? And hey, we had a good service. Uh, the music went long. No, that's a lie. That's a lie. I went long, but thank y'all for being patient. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. I, I know what we're about to experience. There's some oil on Brother Mike, this team, and this choir. That's, it's, it's fresh oil today. So I pray that our hearts would be reminded and we receive what you're about to do through these vessels of your ministry and mercy. Let this room declare in the face of an unraveling world, we're children of the Most High. And if the world spins off into hell, here's the one blessed hope we have. We're headed home to heaven. Until then, keep us faithful. Let no spirit that's not in agreement with the Holy Spirit have any authority in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand one more time.
church say amen. I'm going to tell you, that right there is worth a drive. I don't care what the preaching is, that right there is worth coming. And I want you to know, uh, if it, perhaps, you know, in a, uh, a room with this many people and so many watching, I, I am acutely aware that not everybody has a viable, living, biblical relationship with Jesus Christ. And perhaps this morning you've come out of curiosity more than conviction and you wonder to yourself, how in the world could folks like this sing about the glory of God and filling our hearts and filling the earth? Do, do they not know from Seattle to Chicago, from New York to, uh, to Dallas, Texas, from Dearborn, Michigan, they are marching in the streets celebrating what, what is unequivocally, um, without question, uh, evil. Hamas is, is not a political movement. It is a demonic infiltration into the heart and the soul of humanity that is uh, pressing in not only against the people of God, which we're going to look at in just a moment. So you would, you would wonder, how, why, how? How can a church sing like this and praise God with all of, the, all of the agonies that are going on? I'm going to tell you how we're singing it. We're singing it by faith. Amen. Because what's going on right now in the current event does not eclipse the fact that this world is not our home. And Jesus Christ is coming. God's still on the throne. And it doesn't matter how bad it gets, how dark it may grow, beloved. I'm telling you this. God's sitting high, looking low. And you can rest assured he's still in control. Amen. Take your copy of God's word. I want you, if you would, to please go to uh, Psalm 122. It is the foundational text that we'll unpack for just a moment. Psalm 122 and verse 6 is uh, the text that will set the tenor and the tone for us this morning. As we unpack God's biblical truth concerning what does it mean to pray for the peace of Israel. I'm going to um, stick very close to my notes. Uh, I, I typically preach with an outline that I trust God has put together and anointed this morning because of the sensitivity of the subject and the need to be very specific in my language because sadly what I'm going to present to you this morning as Christy and I were greeting guests that... Uh, had driven in from a considerable distance, and with sadness in their voice and tears in their eyes, they simply said to us, please pray for our church. And I'm talking about a Southern Baptist church. I'm talking about one of the oldest Southern Baptist churches uh, in, in our convention. Uh, they looked at us and wept and said, we had to drive here this morning because our church is practicing a doctrine called replacement theology. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm aware that perhaps you don't know exactly what that is. In the month of November, I don't know the date, and you wouldn't remember if I did know it. But uh, on one of the Sunday evenings, I'm going to be dedicating 
the entirety of that Sunday evening to teaching what is this, what is this theological kudzu that is smothering our churches and teaching our young preacher boys to embrace a doctrine that has replaced Israel with the church that is not in the Bible. Now, I'm going to show you that in just a moment. And what scares me about replacement theology is not, it's not just a theological difference. It is, it is this truth. Whom blesses Israel, God will bless. But beloved, you better believe this. Who, who ignores or wrongly handles Israel, God will not bless. Now, listen, I love the church I pastor. I, I, I mean this. We're not, I'm not trying to get the job. I got it. We voted. We're not going to vote again. Amen. <laughs> Them days are over. You're stuck. You should have voted different. Some of you saying, well, I wasn't here to vote. That's on you. I'm here until God says different. Amen? Amen. Now, listen to me. I love this church. I believe it's one of the great Bible churches in America. I'm thankful for the conviction of this church. We don't vote where we're going. We don't fight over what God tells us to do. We're a people of faith. Deacons don't run this church. This pastor doesn't run this church. The word of God is our authority. Do you hear me well? Listen to me. The moment we move off this book, the moment that you mess with God's covenant people called Israel, you will forfeit the blessings of God. That's why today is so important. So what do we mean when we say we're praying for the peace of Israel? Well, look at Psalm 122. Psalm 122. Uh, I know you were just seated, so just stay right there for the sake of time because we got a lot to get through and a little time to do it. Psalm 122 and verse 6 is where we're fixing our attention, our affection. If you're ready, say amen. And the sacred text says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls. Prosperity within your palaces. Father, thank you for your sacred word that was written thousands of years before we would even know we needed it. God, when you caused the psalmist, when you caused the the prophet David who prophesied with his harp to put his pen to the parchment, you knew You knew when he put the rhythm of redemption in Psalm 122 that there would come a day when a bunch of Bible-believing, Jesus-loving folks would need the assurance of your word. So today, we stand in agreement and alignment with the authority of who you are. And we thank you, God, that no spirit but the Holy Spirit is welcome in this place. And all God's children said, Amen. Now, listen, uh, what, what do we mean when we say we're praying for the peace of Israel? This, this is what we mean. We are quite literally, quite l- theologically, literally praying for the coming of Jesus Christ because he is the Prince of Peace. And there will be no peace in the Middle East until Jesus comes back. So this morning, uh, I, we're going to unpack just two or three very simple biblical truths. And I want to share with you how this came about and uh, what God put on my heart. You know, Christy and I, uh, had gotten away for a few days. We had to leave a little bit early. Uh, I am old enough in the ministry now. I'm matured, uh, and we had to put family before ministry. And I want to say to every young minister, every young pastor, preacher, missionary, don't ever put your ministry ahead of your family. You, you, because if you put your ministry ahead of your family, you'll lose your family, and then you'll lose your ministry. So we had to leave out a little bit early. And um, I, I, as we were leaving out, of course, our phones began to uh, alert and light up, and folks, friends that we have in both Israel and people that uh, know us began to say, are you watching what's going on? And I did my best to leave it alone. I, I, I wanted to rest. We need to get away. And I, I didn't say anything about it publicly for a few days. And the Holy Spirit woke me up uh, that morning that I uh, put the little teaching together and put it online. And uh, because I really felt that even though I was away as a pastor, I, those that I had the privilege to love and serve needed to hear uh, for just a moment Uh, that it's okay, God's in control. And I know you knew that, but I wanted to give you a scriptural reference for that. Those who uh, help with Jeff Laborde Ministries, uh, not the Fairview end of it, but Jeff Laborde Ministries, told us just a couple days ago that some 150,000 plus people have viewed that teaching across the nation and the world. People are hungry to understand what's going on. So today what we're going to do is we're focusing on what is a highly controversial, unquestionably divisive subject. Some would even suggest that it's dangerous to touch this topic. But I want you to understand in an unwavering, unequivocal, and eternal support, this church unapologetically stands with a nation and the people of Israel. And I'm going to speak to you in just a moment what that means and what that does not mean. 
Christy and I have been privileged to lead numerous trips, spiritual pilgrimages to Israel. They have forever changed our lives. We don't take tours. We don't go on vacation to Israel. We work, we teach, we take folks to what is called the fifth gospel, the land of Israel. It is the land of our Lord. And if you're a believer, there's a day coming. In fact, if you don't get to go to Israel, perhaps, you know, Chris and I have even talked about we're scheduled to go back uh, for another pilgrimage. And we talked about the fact that we may not get to go back uh, because of how closeness the coming of, Je- the close- the coming of Jesus is. But I'm going to tell you something. If you're a believer, you're going to go one day. In fact, you're going to go on a white horse in a marriage garment, and you're going to watch our Savior step down on the, Mount, on, the, on the Mount of Olives, and that thing's going to cleave asunder, and we're going to walk up the valley of Armageddon, and every enemy, every demonic field, evil, wicked spirit is going to yield and die, and the King of Kings is going to rule throughout all of eternity. So you're going to Jerusalem one day, beloved. You bank on it. Now, we're going to live in the new Jerusalem, but that's a different topic and a different time. Uh, While we were there, something um, that set this trip apart more than any that I've ever taken. In fact, so much so that it altered the heart of me personally and pastorally. Something happened to me while I was in the land, the fifth gospel of Israel. I'd gotten up early that morning and I was in my private praise and prayer time. And I had been asking the Lord uh, for a very specific thing for Fairview. And I'd ask him to open some doors and to do some things that I knew could only come from him. And as I spent my time in the Word, I I was impressed of the Spirit to go to Romans chapter 1. Now, I've been to Romans chapter 1. It's one of the greatest theological passages in all of the New Testament. Um, But something happened to me, I will share with you in a moment, that leaped up off that page and sat down into my spirit. So today, our goal is to answer just a few of the endless questions that could be asked in the wake of October the 7th when Hamas... Uh, infiltrated, invaded Israel, and slaughtered over 1,400, most of which were not military nor law enforcement. Almost all of them were innocents. And I cannot go into the descriptions that we've received from those over there of the heinous, ungodly, horrific acts that took place as they invaded those kibbutz uh, in the south in, uh, uh, around the Gaza Strip. So um, 15 days ago, our world shifted. Now, if you don't listen to anything else I say, if you don't agree with anything else I'm about to present from the Word of God, I need your undivided attention for just the next few moments. So if you're a student or, or, or you're just distracted, I need you to put your phone down. And I'm asking you in Jesus' name to give me your undivided attention for just a moment. I want you to listen to what I'm about to say to you. Fifteen days ago, our world was altered in a way we could not have imagined. Beloved, we are no longer in the last days. We are in the last moments of the last hours before the rapture of the church. These 15 days have not only awakened us to the reality that this world is no longer our home, but the severity of the attacks and the velocity of what is taking place in these 15 days. For example, our most um, uh, well-equipped, technically advantaged Uh, carrier, the Gerald R. Ford and the Dwight D. Eisenhower carriers, strike groups, which are nuclear, both in their fueling and in their uh, armament, are now in the Mediterranean Sea. And we were told in the last 12 hours that uh, our men and women in uniform have uh, been called to battle readiness. The USS Kearney, the U.S. Navy destroyer, is located in the Red Sea, continues to intercept multiple high-tech missiles that are not being built by Hamas. They're not being built by Hezbollah. They are being built by two of the leading enemies of the United States and of Israel. Two days ago, on October the 20th, the U.S. conducted for the first time in decades a nuclear test in Nevada only moments after Russia revoked the ban on atomic weapons testing. To do so is to simply say to the world that this thing could go nuclear. The Chinese military only a handful of days ago have mobilized their largest um, deployment of warships, six in total, that rival in some capacity even the technology that we have, which personally they stole most of that, but I'll move on. So don't tear up your guest card. If you got offended, hold on, I'm going to offend you a lot more before you go home. Yesterday, 
uh, Russia's leader, Putin, and China's leader, uh, Xi, um, met in Beijing to strengthen their diplomatic and military ties. Now, here's my point. Listen to me. My, my heart and my motivation is not to use current events to manipulate you or to scare you. That's not my point. I, I don't want you to get stirred up emotionally because our world is flying apart. A local educator called me and said to me, I'm going to tell you something, Pastor, that uh, um, has not happened in my time of teaching in this area. Over the intercom, uh, they reminded all of the high school boys and girls, and you need to check this. Do not take my word for this. It is now a legislative bill in this nation that sons and daughters will be drafted. You need to check that. It, it's, uh, I, I've gone back, done my research, and I certainly would not present to you something that I did not believe accurate, but to the best of my exhaustive uh, research, and I've put in two calls, one to a representative and one to a senator, but I have read the bill, and it, it drafts by lottery first those that are 18 in the year 2023, both sons and daughters. Now, I want to say something. Ladies, I pray you hear my heart. Now, I, I'm, I'm not making a commentary on women. But according to the word of God, it is not the job of a woman to uniform up. Now, I know Israel's IDF uses their ladies, but I want you to, I'm raised old-fashioned. I, I know some of you don't like that, and you think I'm a chauvinist. You don't know the half of it. I still open the door for my wife. I brought up my boy to open doors for women. He opened the door one day. He was out with me preaching. He opened the door at a shell station for a lady, and she said, this is mean. She said, I can open my own door. And he said, well, my daddy taught me to open doors for ladies. She said, I don't need you to open my door. He said, well, you ain't a lady. You open it yourself. So he's probably right. But <laughs> Now, I don't care if you like this or not. We got no business sending our daughters into combat. Do you understand that? No business, none at all. So uh, I say to every representative and whoever, whoever shares this or sends it to wherever it goes, in the name of God, if what I'm reading legislatively is to commandeer and draft our daughters to put them in uniform, let me just give you, just to make, let me just take a little advice from an old-fashioned Baptist preacher right here. Just teach our men to be men and you won't have to send the women. Amen? Just teach our men to be men. That's all you got to do. That's all you got to do. Quit, quit emasculating them. Quit raising them in the basement in their SpongeBob SquarePants pajamas. And for the love of God, put some camo on them. Take them out let them kill something. And they'll take care of business when it comes down to it. Don't send our... In fact, I'm going to tell you, you ain't sending my daughters. Now, I'm just going to tell you. I got three little ones. You. <laughs> my motivation is not to manipulate. There has never been a time in 30 plus years of pastoral ministry that I've had a greater alarm and awareness of the burden of God on my heart to come to this helm this morning. I am acutely aware of how absolutely close we are to not only World War III, but to the prophetic unfolding of God's divine plan. Israel is the centerpiece of that. Therefore, the Bible instructs me in Ezekiel chapter 33 that if I've been called as a watchman to stand on the wall and to sound the alarm and I fail to do so, that your blood's on my hands. But it also says if you fail to hear the word that the watchman gives, your blood's on your hands. So this morning, this is what I'm asking you. I know that what I'm going to present to you because we've raised an American church that operates more in the opinion of the pew than it does the authority of the Bible. We, we tend to come and listen to our pastors and we, we listen to what they say and then we get in the parking lot and we have a business meeting in the car and we decide whether or not we're going to take what he said. I want you to understand something. I don't get up here and preach the Bible so that you can go and figure out whether or not you're going to obey it. I preach the word of God because it's the word of God. And if you don't know this, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 following says that we're bought with a price. You know what that means? That means your opinion doesn't mean a thing. That means my opinion doesn't mean a thing. And if the Word of God says it, that settles it. You know, we used to say it this way. Boy, I tell you, the Bible says it. I believe it, and that settles it. No goober gump. It does not settle it. The Word of God said it. That settles it. Do you understand it? Doesn't matter what we feel about it. So this, this perennial problem of replacement theology that's telling us that somehow or another God replaced his covenant people called the Hebrews, Israel, with the church is absolutely not in the Word of God. What I'm saying to you this morning is, do not be deceived. Do not be taken captive by hollow and vain doctrine. The world is shifting. America is waning. 
the attention, the focus, the global, the, the, all of the global impact, it's moving back to the Middle East because it's been prophesied. And prophecy is not the foretelling of an event. It is, it is pre-written history where God simply says, y'all better wake up because this is what's coming. So I'm simply asking you this, if you're born again, don't take this morning's text, don't take the word of God and debate with it, simply yield to it so that God might have all of his glory. Now, what do I not mean when I say that we stand in support of Israel? Let me tell you what I don't mean. I do not mean that we support Israel's uh, political system. I'm not talking about Netanyahu. I'm not talking about the Knesset. I'm not talking about their political, their financial. I'm not even talking about their military. I'm talking about we obey the word of God because the word, as you're going to see in a moment, tells us to pray for Israel because he has an eternal covenant with them that they broke when they rejected Messiah who came, Jesus, when he was born of a virgin, they rejected him. So I'm not talking about uh, supporting Israel politically. I'm not talking about Christian Zionism in that sense of the word. I want you to understand something. Israel is a blinded people. Many will be surprised and push back at what I'm about to say. Israel is among the leading developed nations in the world in abortion. They kill more unborn children than almost any other nation in the world. Tel Aviv is the homosexual capital of the world. When Christy and I were leading the most recent pilgrimage over there with some of you that are in this room right now, you will remember our very, our very trajectory, our very day was altered because of, of that alpha, that, uh, alpha, the mafia alphabet moved in to Jerusalem and we couldn't get through the streets because of the, because of the homosexuals and the transgenders marching through the streets of Jerusalem and celebrating who they are. Now, here's the question. Now, now, that doesn't make sense to us, Pastor, because if you're saying they're God's chosen people, how in the world could they em embrace abortion and, 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 and homosexuality? How could it be? Well, it's almost like the Apostle Paul anticipated that in Romans chapter 11, verse 25. He says it this way. Now, listen to this. He says, I don't desire, brethren, that you be ignorant of this mystery. It's almost like he said, you know, there's going to come a day when they're going to wonder. How could people that had all the prophecies of the coming of Messiah, I mean, think about it. He's going to be born of a virgin. He, he was told that they knew where he was going to be born, how he was going to be born. They knew the signs to look for where he was going to be born. I looked it up in my study this week. Some 80-some-odd prophecies that were so specific that it almost gave the exact address of where he was going to be born. So I, I used to wonder as a new believer, how in the world, how in the world does a people that have been given the divinely inspired word of God, the Old Testament, Messiah's coming, the seed of the woman. How in the world could they miss born of a virgin, born, born in, in, in a little town called Bethlehem? How could they miss all of the signs and the wonder and the work of the Holy Spirit and his word? I'm going to tell you how. They didn't miss him. They rejected him. Now, I want you to listen carefully to what I'm going to say to you. You better be careful rejecting the wooing of the Holy Spirit in these last days. Because we are on the brink of what is called the great falling away. You and I are living in a day of great apostasy. We are standing on the brink of watching churches that once preached the infallible word of God are now wavering and halting between two opinions. Churches that once stood flat-footed unapologetically and made a plea for souls to be saved won't even give a gospel invitation anymore. Now they're saying, oh, well, perhaps God has made some kind of arrangement that men might marry men and women might marry women and it's perfectly okay to infiltrate the minds of our sons and daughters and mutilate their bodies and confuse their spirits. I'm telling you, God still in heaven and this book's still true. Be careful. You are living in a day that's not only prophesied that the trembling of the cup of Jerusalem will crush many nations. You're living in a day that says that there's a wave of deception, a darkness of demonic doctrine. How could it be that we live in a nation today? They are marching in the streets. Elected officials are standing in the capital of this great nation, waving the flag of a demonic entity and, and doctrine called Hamas, calling for Israel to just lay down her arms. What in the name of all that is holy has happened to this great nation? I'll tell you what, we told God, just like Israel, we told God about, about 40 years, 45 years ago, we don't want you in your schools. Well, let me just say something. When you tell God you don't want him in your schools and the kids can't pray, don't get mad at God for Columbine. We're the ones told him to get out. Do you understand that? 
Do you know the Supreme Court, when they ruled on taking the Ten Commandments down, legitimately, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but I promise you I'm very close to the language. In the, in, the, in the writing, in the decree to take them out of the public arena and out of public schools, this is what one of the justices said. You have to take the Ten Commandments down lest the kids read them and obey them. Thou shalt not kill. Well, hello, goober. What did you think was going to happen? We are living on the brink of a shift prophetically. I personally believe, according to this book, that the rapture is so imminent that even at this point right now, the, the trembling in the Middle East that's, that's unpacking is simply setting the stage because Paul said there's coming a day in the middle of chaos, they're going to rise up and say, peace and safety, peace and safety. Somebody's going to show up on the scene soon, very soon. I think there are two passages I would give you, and for the sake of time, I don't have time to teach you this morning, but I would simply leave you with this. I think you need to study Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 34 and following. It's called the prophecy of Halam, and I think you need to pay attention to it because I suspect that we are on the brink of watching. Elam is modern day. It's in the south part of Iran on the Persian Gulf. It is the number one nuclear producing factory uh, uh, center for Iran. And it is no longer a matter of Iran producing nuclear warheads. They've produced the nuclear warheads. And I'm going to say something to you. They did it with the money that we sent them. And, and what we know from those who are strategists, they have developed the warhead, but they don't have the military, the system to deliver it. So when you study Jeremiah 49, which is a prophecy that's coming to us, I need you to hear me. Pay attention to the bow and the arrow. And then pay attention to the fact that it's a prophecy that says that the destruction of Elam is so significant that it causes a global migration. And if you read it, now I'm not trying to tell you how to read it. I'm just telling you how your pastor read it. When I read that text of that prophecy that I believe we're on the brink of, because here's the, here's the theme of Iran. Iran has said this clearly. Their theme globally, their theme nationally is this. When Chris and I fly in uh, to, to Israel, we always take our pilgrimage to the Holocaust Museum. Now, I love the people that put my tours together because they help me in a way that it's not a tour in the sense of vacation. It's a pilgrimage. It's a spiritual walk into the fifth gospel. But every time without fail, since we've been going in the year 2000, this is what they'll say to me. Oh, you, you don't want to go to the Holocaust Museum. That's a Debbie Downer. You don't want to take them through the Children's Museum where you hear the names of those little children that Hitler pulled and made lampshades out of and experimented on them. And, and if, if, when you walk into the Children's Holocaust Museum, you'll hear little names like Abraham and Shalom and Esther and Ruth, it will take you, if you stayed there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which they don't play it on Sabbath, but if you stayed there to hear all of the names that they know that were killed in the Holocaust, it would take you seven years to get from the beginning of the list to the end of the list. And they say to me, oh, pastor, you don't want to take your people there. Yes, I do. Because I want you to understand something. You need to come home and you need to tell your folks that are being taught in these universities that are saying there was no Holocaust. You've seen it firsthand and it is. And Israel says never again. They're never going to get on another train. They're never going to go to the end of the line. They're never going to get promised. Just get on the train. There's a shower and a warm meal and a job. They will die fighting instead of lay down and let them kill them. You and I are living in some of the most exciting, excruciating, terrifying, terrific, horrific, exhilarating times that a believer can live in. We are on the brink of one of the greatest moves of the Spirit because soon God's going to turn to his son and say, prayer meeting's over. Get up. Tell your bride. Come on home. Come on home. Paul said that there's a mystery. They've been blinded. I'm going to say this though, uh, very quickly. I, I remember the first time that uh, Christy and I went to Israel. Uh, it was back in our home in Savannah, the church we pastored there almost 12 years. And the church for pastor appreciation, they, unbeknownst to us, they got together and they took up a big old love offering and they sent Christy and I on a tour to Israel. We were absolutely elated. We'd begin to learn a little bit theologically about God's plan and purpose. She was a teacher for K. Arthur. I had been trained at one of the great universities and seminaries, Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary with Dr. Falwell. And I'd never seen the truth of God's chosen people. And we were so excited. And, 
and I mean this with the deepest respect, uh, my wife put on her best pair of overalls, packed us up. She had the cutest little pair of overalls. They rolled about halfway up, and, and that big smile of hers, and we jumped on a plane, flew to New York so we could fly over to Tel Aviv, and she was so happy. I already had a love of people, and we didn't know anything about what we were doing. We sat down in the New York airport, and we were walking through that big old New York airport, and she was so excited to get to meet Jewish people. Well, there was a big old gaggle. We didn't know this at the time. There was a big old crowd of Jewish men right in the middle of that airport, and we didn't know that it, New York had the single largest concentration of Jews now, they don't anymore. Israel does now. But at that time, they did. More Jews lived in New York than anywhere in the world. Well, Christy took, I mean, I couldn't even get her. She's taller and long-legged. I couldn't even catch her. <laughs> all I could see was that hair flying in the air, buddy. That's all I could see. <laughs> and I knew when I saw her where she was going, buddy. She was headed straight to those Hasidic Jews. You know, they had the curls and the caps and the tallits, And she was so happy she couldn't wait to meet her first Jew. And she just busted right up in them like a chicken coop. And she said, hey, y'all. <laughs> We're going to Israel with y'all. In the Middle East, the way to insult somebody, uh, one of the most, most profane things you can do is stomp your foot. So like if, you, if you offend a Jew in Israel, they'll stomp that foot, and that just immediately says um, it's equivalent to some things y'all do right here. <laughs> Let me look over here because I've seen two or three of them do it. So they all stomped at her and hissed. Boy, I just watched her. I just watched her kind of melt. Because they, she's, number one, she's a goyman. She's a Gentile. And she's a woman. They're not even allowed to speak to their own wives in public. You see a Jewish ascetic woman, you won't see her hair. You'll see a wig because she's not allowed to show her hair to anybody, even her husband, except for the sanctity of the bedroom. Now, I watched her just kind of wilt. And what we learned is this stiff-necked, hard-hearted people called the Jews who had rejected Messiah now have a blindness. And in order to break that heart and to make it palatable for the work of the Spirit so that those two witnesses can begin to preach and the 144,000 male evangelists, Jewish evangelists, can preach the gospel after we're gone, part of that process of the tribulation is not that God's mad at the world. It is quite literally when you read about the seals, the vials, the trumps, the woes, the agonies, when you read about that, that is not God not loving the world. That is God saying to the world, you don't want me. This is the world without me. And out of that agony of the tribulation that you read in the book of Revelation, it's simply God breaking the Jew to say, I'm coming again. And this time when I come, you will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So we don't, we, we're not talking about some kind of political stand. We're talking about a spiritual stand. As believers, uh, we yield to the word of God. So very quickly, I want to give this to you and we're going to be done. I'm going to give you three very simple truths. Number one, why do, we, why do we support Israel as a faith family and as believers? Number one, because of the revelation of God's word. The revelation of God's word. Now, here's, here's what I'm going to go back to very quickly. In that motel room in Israel... God so sat down in that time. I was in Romans chapter 1 by the leadership of the Spirit, and I had asked God very specifically about a couple of things, and I've read Romans 1 several times, but this time I saw something I'd never seen. Y'all ever have that happen? You ever read a passage a hundred times, and it comes up off that page as if you'd never seen it before, and there's revelation. That's called a rhema. You have the logos word, and you have the rhema. Rhema is when God personalizes it. I got to Romans chapter 1, verse 16, and this is what it says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. That means anybody, male, female, Gentile, Jew, doesn't matter, Arab, Hamas, it doesn't, anybody that will believe, anybody that will confess Christ can be saved. Now watch this. For I'm not ashamed of the, the, the power of God unto sal of salvation for everyone who believes. Now listen to it. For the Jew first... And also for the Greek. And for the first time, it, I mean, I was almost embarrassed. It was as if the Holy Spirit said, Jeff, you're asking me 
to come and do something supernaturally in your ministry personally, in your family corporately, and in the faith family called Fairview Knox. But son, in order for me to be able to do what I need to do, I need you to align your priorities with me. And for the first time I saw it, to the Jew first. To the Jew first. And it was in that moment that it just all began to come together. And I thought, no, wait a minute. That's so obvious. Stevie Wonder could have seen this. How in the world did I miss this? Because he said in, in Genesis 12, whom blesses Israel, I'll bless. Over and over again. Over and over again, he gives this mandate to the Jew. Do you know the only reason that he came and got us the bride of Jesus Christ? He, he came and saved, was to produce a level of jealousy so that in un, uncircumcised goyment, Gentiles, the Jews would look at us and say, what in the world? How can they be so blessed? How is it that they can be so blessed? And we provoke them to jealousy in order to bring them to Jesus. So I said to the Father, Lord, I understand I know that it's not necessarily American. I understand that it may not even be necessarily congruent with Baptist. But I promise you, when we leave this fifth gospel Israel, I promise you, if you'll show me how to make the Jew first, give us an effectual door to touch Israel with the gospel of Jesus Christ, I give you my word. If it costs me my job at Fairview, I give you my word, I'm going to do it. And do you know before I got on that plane to come home, can you imagine this? My ministry assistant, Miss Anna Cantrell, sent me an email and said, hey, don't, don't, um, don't play anything here because after almost eight years of living in this city, I had no rabbinical uh, messianic relationships. I didn't know any of the messianic rabbis. I hadn't built any relationships because quite candidly, I was just trying to stay alive, but that's another story. And I didn't have any. Do you know that while I was in Israel, and if I could prove it, I believe it was the very moment that I said to the Holy Spirit, I yield to it. She said, a rabbi, a messianic rabbi from one of the local messianic congregations has contacted and asked, could you come and have lunch with him and some other rabbis? No more than 48 hours after I got off that plane, I made my way to meet with a host of rabbinical uh, um, messianic pastors, and they just happened to have a man who is a rabbinical Jewish believer who lives in Israel and he's doing missions to win. Now listen to it. Not just Jews. Not, 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 not just the Jewish people. Palestinian people. Arab people. Muslim people. And he was in the lunch. And I walked right up to him and said, I had to go all the way to Israel to find you. <laughs> he said, well, I haven't been in Israel in a month. I said, I was over there looking for you. And the Holy Spirit sent me here to see you. And in that moment, our hearts melted. And in just a moment, I'm going to introduce you to him through the miracle of technology. We support Israel because of the revelation of God's word. Now, let me give this to you very quickly. What does that mean? It simply means this. It means that because Israel is the only sovereign nation created by God. Do you know that no other nation has its borders determined and defined other than the nation of Israel by God in the Bible? 22 times the Bible records God's land covenant over Israel. The city of Jerusalem is mentioned 700 times in the Bible. Jerusalem is not mentioned one time in the Islamic Quran. And the only reason that they're there is because they are demonically motivated to keep the Jews from going up on that temple mount. Jesus was born in Israel, crucified, buried, and left from Israel. And the next time he comes back, according to Zechariah chapter 14, the very place he's coming back to is called Israel. Second Chronicles 6, 6 says, I have chosen Jerusalem that my name may be there. I have chosen David to be over my people forever, Israel. Deuteronomy 7, 6 says, For you, O Israel, are my people, holy unto the Lord. The Lord God has chosen you out of all peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Deuteronomy 32, verse 9 and following. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. That's a synonym for, for Israel. He has found them in a desert land, in the wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled them and instructed them, and he has kept them as the apple of his eye. Jeremiah 31, 35, to all the naysaying scoffers that say, oh, no, no, preacher, you're wrong. When Israel rejected Jesus, Jesus rejected Israel, and the church has taken over all the promises spiritually. Therefore, the book of Revelation has no, has no place. The book of Daniel, all this stuff you're preaching, preacher, has nothing to do with it. Listen to this. Jeremiah 31, verse 35 and following. Thus saith the Lord God, 
He who gives the sun for the light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for the light by night, who distributes the seas and causes the waves to roar. If those ordinances depart, let me, let me put it in plain vernacular, Jeffrey Thomas terminology. If the sun refuses to shine and the moon refuses to rise, if the stars refuse to twinkle and the waves refuse to crash on the sands of the shore, if that were to come, I will forsake my people Israel and walk off, which he's, he's speaking in rhetorical. What he's saying is that's never going to happen. It isn't going to happen. I didn't break my covenant. I've not forgotten them. In fact, let's just be honest. Aren't you thankful to God that the first time we got stiff neck, hard heart, and didn't do what he called us to do, he didn't walk off from us. Now, you better be careful with your theology because if he can walk off from Israel, whom he made an eternal covenant with, gave him a land, gave him a language, gave him a covenant. He took a man by the name of Abram, whose name meant many, father of many, who didn't have any, not a one. You know God's got a sense of humor. Y'all look sitting who's next to you right now and tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. God got a sense of humor. He took a man who was already a member of the AARP, whose name meant father of many, who didn't have any. And then he waited till the man's wife, Sarah, was going down to the CVS to get some Depends and told her to pick up some Pampers. That's how God works. Y'all go on and doubt it. We're going to pray right now. There's a woman here who'll tell you, I can pray it in. I'm going to pray some of you 70, 80, 90-year-olds get pregnant right now. Name Jesus. I ain't keeping them. (laughs) Lord, y'all won't keep the ones God's bringing us. What are you going to do with the one? Anyway. See, God's word's definitive. And you're just going to have to make a decision, beloved, because I'm going to tell you something. Just this quick, it went from sympathy for Israel to almost overnight in our nation. They are, I'm talking about elected representatives, are standing in the halls of the nation's capital saying, you need to tell Israel to just lay down and die. You, you have, that's why I gave you Psalm 83. I, I fully believe that Psalm 83 is on the brink of happening right now because there's a coalition that's building that ring of fire and they smell blood in the water because we have weak leadership in this nation right now. And I'm just going to say this while I'm ticking some of you off. You need to, you need to pay attention to history because every time they talk you out of giving, giving up your Second Amendment rights, every time they've in any nation ever said, if you'll just give us your, 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 your arms, we'll protect you. Are you smoking seven kinds of crack? Have you paid attention to what's happening? Listen to me. I'm unapologetic. I'm not giving up nothing. Do you understand? that i'm not giving up nothing men and women died that we might have the second amendment and the last time i checked these bunch of nutcases called liberals that wouldn't know the constitution in a room with a with a microscope have they're not my protection you understand that Uh, you're a preacher you're not supposed to hurt him break in my house and find out how much preach i got on me (laughs) break in my house i'll kill you until god you died by the way, I got Old Testament standard that said that any man, a man break in a home in the middle. It's an Old Testament. Now, this is a loose translation. Thou might unload both barrels. I mean, that's a loose translation. But it's in there. Y'all better wake up. Now, I know, I know. I'm, y'all going to write me letters. You're going to send me cards. Oh, preacher, you won't have a seating problem next week. That's fine. Because if that's how you believe, you don't come to wrong church anyway. This is a constitutional republic, and for the name of all that's holy, what in the name of God do we have elected officials saying that it is permissible for a demonic force called Hamas? We're not talking about the Palestinian people. We're talking about terrorists. We're talking about people that that extricated children out of the bellies of living mamas, held their children up after they ripped them out of their womb, and then shot the mother. What in the name of all that is holy could anybody in this nation stand and march in the streets and say, we support Hamas? You don't have to even believe in Israel. And let me say something to you. You better stay locked and loaded because it isn't a matter of when they're going to get here. They're here. And if you don't believe that, you turn on the television and you watch them by the thousands from Chicago to Seattle, from New York to Dallas, Texas, to Dearborn, Michigan, by the thousands, they are marching in the street. And you hear me well, and I say this without equivocation or apology, they do not come to assimilate, they come to take over. The word Islam does not mean peace, that's a lie. The word Islam means submit, and if you don't submit, you die. That's why it is a blight. And if you listen to some of our songs from the past, from the halls of truth, 
triple E, you need to do your history. The reason it was triple E is because we sent some Marines over there with a little old packed lunch and they whooped up on them boys and said, you're not bringing that mess to America. And I'm calling on every elected official that might hear this when I get blown up online for the name of all that's holy. Your job is not to protect anybody else but this place first. Close the border and in the name of God, protect the United States of America. Lord, we're going to get audited. We're going to get, I'm going to jail. Somebody told me the other day, you do know you're on a list. I'm on all of them. I'm on every one of them. We, we, we support Israel cause, cause, because of the revelation of God's word. Now, here's how I'm almost done. Y'all okay? Yeah. <laughs> I bet overflow is cleared out. <laughs> We, we, not only do we, do we believe because of the revelation of God's word, which I've shared with you just some of, the, some of them. Not, not, and there's no way to share all of them. Here, here's the second. We recognize Israel to be God's covenant people because, because of God's supernatural protection. Now, I, I, can only, I only got time to get, really give you just one of these, just one of these. But I'm telling you quite literally, I could stay here for an extended amount of time just to share with you over and over again what I'm about to share. If you're a student of history, this name's going to mean a lot to you. His name is Edmund Allenby, General Ellen, uh, Allen, uh, uh, Edmund Allenby. Uh, General Allenby is a, a great figure that came out of World War I. Now, for those of you who perhaps don't know, World War I, uh, about 1915 to 1917, 1918, Allenby was not only a strategic genius, British genius, military genius, he was a deeply dedicated believer in Christ. The Ottoman Empire... From 1499 until about 1917, controlled for about 400 years, they controlled Israel. The Islamic people did. Well, in World War I, Allenby, Allenby gets outside of Israel, and they're about to take it back from the Ottoman Empire, the Muslims. They, they are about to go in, and Allenby stops and says, Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is the city of my Lord. I need to spend the night praying before we go in because I don't want to destroy a sacred city. There's no other city like Jerusalem, according to Allenby's diary. So he goes into his tent. He tells his chief commanders, you wait until I get a word from God. Can you imagine having that kind of leadership? According to records, substantiated over and over and over again, Allenby was preparing for battle. Uh, ultimately, he's going to liberate Jerusalem, but out of a deep concern to not... Uh, wound the city or destroy her sacred holy sites, he was praying and he felt prompted of the Lord to go to a specific verse. Now, now, now contextually, stay with me. This is 1917 and, and the aeroplane, I'm saying it the way history says, the aeroplane was a brand new invention. At World War I was, was, was just beginning to realize the, 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 the advantage of having an air force. But they hadn't really begun to unpack it yet. Allen B. is praying, Lord, how do I take your city without any more destruction or being disrespectful? In fact, when he does take the city, Allen B. in classic World War I context, he rides a white horse after the victory. He gets right outside the Jaffa Gate and he stops. His men are cheering him on. Right on, General. Right on. He's the white horse. He's the conqueror of Jerusalem. And he stops and steps off his horse. And they say, General, what, what are you doing? He said, old, old fellas, I, I, don't, I don't deserve to ride in here because there is one coming on a white horse who will liberate it forever. That night when he was praying, he was reminded that there was a small contingency of a fledgling, they didn't even call it an air force, it was just an aeroplane, a couple of them that they had used in some uh, reconnaissance. The Lord gave him a verse from Isaiah 31, verse 5. The next time some moss-backed, stiff-necked, bylaw-toting preacher tells you God doesn't speak anymore, you share this with him. Right in the middle of his private praise and prayer time, the Holy Ghost took him to Isaiah chapter 31, verse 5. Listen to what it says. Like birds flying about, so with the Lord of hosts. That word quite literally, Lord of hosts, it quite literally means defender. The Lord of war. The Lord of hosts will defend Jerusalem. Defending, he will also deliver it. Passing over her, he will preserve her. Allenby, he got up. He got up and he said, he got, he got a couple of airplanes. He said, boys, I want you to fly over Jerusalem. 
and I want you to drop some leaflets and tell these, these, these Ottoman Muslims, you can put your arms down and you can walk out and we won't, we won't mop it up with you. Do you know when they saw those airplanes there, they're living in the Middle East in the 19, early 19, they'd never seen an aeroplane. <laughs> They thought it was some kind of demonic something. They were freaked out. They just laid their weapons down, walked outside and said, whatever that was, please don't send it anymore. (laughs) Do you know where he got that idea? The prophet Isaiah, 700 years before, well, no, more than that, but 14, 1,500 years before Alby was ever even born. Can you imagine? Do you know why? Because God will preserve his people. I want you to listen carefully as I get ready to close. I have a sneaking suspicion in my heart. I had it when I got back from Israel that things were about to speed up prophetically. Now, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not telling you I had revelation. That's, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm telling you I just had an, an alarm in my spirit that we're getting so close that it was going to, the, the, the veracity, the, the birth pains were going to, the water is broken. And it isn't going to be a surprise to any of us if we get home today or in the next few days And we find out not only are we in the Mediterranean, not only are we in the Red Sea, but from the north with Hezbollah and with Iran, this is going to become a full-scale World War III. I want you to listen to me. If you're a believer, I'm not telling you not to have anxiety. I'm, I'm going to have it. I've got a son that falls in that range. We've got friends and loved ones that fall in that range for the draft. Educator told me, I don't know if I said this to you already, it said to me uh, for the first time that they can remember ever in a Knox County school system, this past week they came over the intercom system during the announcements and said all able-bodied uh, young men and women need, you are by law mandated to sign up for the draft. Can I tell you what that does to our hearts? I thought of watching our young men and potentially women having to uniform up to go fight. But you hear me well. There's a God in heaven. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. And the church has been playing too long. We've underestimated the power of prayer. We've underestimated the preaching of the gospel. You hear me. The same God that can tell Allenby to go to Isaiah 31 is the same God that can speak to every mama, every daddy, every grandmama. It's the same God who can take your boys and protect them in ways we could not begin to imagine. I don't know what's coming. I don't know how bad it's going to get before we get up and get out of here. But I'm telling you this one thing we do not need to doubt. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. And whatever's coming will never take him by surprise. So what's the last part of this, preacher? If we support Israel because of the revelation of God's word and we support Israel because of the supernatural protection of God's people, what do we do? We prepare. And I'm going to be very candid with you and I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but I need to speak to you very candidly for a moment. It's time for some of y'all to quit getting your supplemental Bible study every Sunday when you decide to come to church. I love you desperately. I give my life for you. I mean that. But some of you, you're not students of the word. You don't get in the word. You don't have a prayer life. You just saved enough to get out of hell. Dads, I'm going to tell you something. It's time for you to set your children down because if you don't tell them what's going on, there's a secular God-hating world that's going to tell them. They're telling them to doubt their, their, their sexuality. They're telling them to embrace a demonic doctrine called Hamas. They're telling them that this book is an antiquated, out of, you know, fictional narrative that doesn't work. It's time for some daddies to say to their sons and daughters, we're going to open the book. It's time for you to get in the book. Oh, pastor, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a pastor. I, 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 don't, I don't know how to study like you do. Listen to me. Look at me. Look at me. Do you know I'm God's joke on some of you? I am God's sense of humor on some of you. 
I am a two-time high school dropout who was addicted to drugs and alcohol that could not read the Bible that I got saved under the preaching of, functionally illiterate. And God has taken an ignorant two-time high school dropout and shown me that what the Spirit can do if all you do is open the book. I'm God's joke on some of you. This room, collectively, far smarter than I'll ever be. Y'all better say amen. <laughs> far smarter than I'll ever be. I'm not smarter because I, stu- I just study harder. What you can get in an hour takes me about eight. That's why I don't golf. Well, I don't golf because golfers are drunks. But anyway, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just picking at one of them over here. It's time for you to get in the Word. And when your kids come home from school and they tell you that they're teaching them that Hamas has been colonized by Israel, that's a lie. Israel didn't colonize that land. They were given that land 4,000 years ago by God. Let me say this lastly to you. I really sense the Holy Spirit saying as Chris and I made our way back home and we'd called for this day that there needed to be something tangible. We needed to do something. And immediately my my rabbi friend came to mind, my missionary friend, Eton. He was a dope-smoking hippie that grew up in America as a, as a non-practicing Jew, and he had a head-on collision with the gospel. Anybody in here ever seen the movie, uh, uh, The Jesus Revolution? He got saved in that. He got saved out of that, that great... Re- in fact, you, you know what I'm talking about. And he spent about 10 years learning how to follow Jesus, he and his wife, and the ministry, and the, and the Spirit said to him... You're a, you're a completed Jew. You're born again. Go home. Make Ali all. Go back. Tell your people, my people, that Jesus has already come. So 30 plus years ago, he packed up, moved to the north part. What you hear about the, the Golan Heights to the north where they're lobbing missiles now, that's where he lives. He's been burned to the ground two or three times already. I want you to hear from him. He sent this to you to share his heart. Turn your attention to the screens. Shalom, dear brothers and sisters of uh, the Fairview Knox Church. Uh, Pastor Jeff, thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you. Uh, I'm speaking to you from the Haifa Bay area of Israel. And I want to give you a brief um, update on the overall situation. Uh, First of all, my wife and I, uh, Connie, I have been here 31 years uh, pioneering Messianic congregations and privileged uh, to start a national youth ministry. Uh, we are so grateful for your your love, your concern, your prayers. Um, at the beginning of this conflict two weeks ago, uh, news broadcasters who are usually cynical were weeping openly on camera and the entire nation entered into shock and grief. So many questions. Um, <laughs> the the penetration into our territory that we we thought was sacrosanct that we were that we were defended and, and could not be breached um, was was like a an, an absolutely violent rape at gunpoint of of the whole country. Some one thousand three hundred people. I'm sure you've seen the statistics. Uh, were brutally murdered. Uh, a minority of those were were police and military personnel trying to defend the people, but the majority were were women, children, elderly, people disfigured, burned alive, just unthinkable things. And so the whole country has been in, in a state of grief. Uh, this is part of what we need to pray about. But the country has also responded with a, a, a unity and a unified action. Uh, some 360,000 reserve soldiers had been called up. This is the majority of our fighting force, joining another 170,000 full-time soldiers but they're not properly equipped. And that's one of the things that our ministries, the congregation that uh, that we founded um, back in the 90s and uh, this national youth ministry that I mentioned, that we are bringing supplies to the soldiers, such basic things as, as socks and underwear and mattresses, um, it's just because of, of being caught uh, by surprise and because of the massive call up uh, so quickly. And this is part of what uh, the Defense Force is waiting, the IDF waiting uh, to go into Gaza. We have to go in. Um, it's, it's, it's a very sad situation. I want to make it clear that this is not a racial conflict. This is a conflict against evil uh, that hell itself has erupted uh, through these, these, these Hamas 
uh, monsters. It's just, it's, it's impossible to describe, but there has to be a response. If you think World War II, the Nazis, um, America, Britain, um, uh, even Russia united to, to stop uh, what was a genocidal attack, this is of the same spirit and in a way uh, even worse. So I want to thank you for your prayers. We want to move into that prayer time right now. Uh, here are some prayer points uh, for you to note down. Um, first, I want to give us just one scripture uh, foundation, Zechariah chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. So God is, God is after those who, who are seeking to destroy Israel. For he who touches you touches the apple uh, of his eye. And now here are some prayer points. First of all, pray that, that those who've been kidnapped will be returned, will be restored to Israel, to their families alive. Uh, they're down in the bowels of Gaza and, and only God knows what's happening with them. They're, they're obviously in, in such, a, such a terrible state. Secondly, pray for the comfort of the families who are mourning, those who were destroyed. Some of the bodies haven't even been able to be identified be, 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 because they were so, so ravaged with fire. Uh, there's such, such mourning going on. Pray for those. Um, pray for those who have not been identified, the identification of, of, uh, of the victims that, that haven't been so that their families can at least receive them, bury them, uh, mourn them. We want to pray against the manipulations in the uh, international media that are that are saying, "Oh, uh, you know, Israel, you're just you're just trying to uh, destroy the Palestinians." As I said before, this war is not against the Palestinians. We, we we want to see those people preserved. Pray pray for the innocent people in Gaza who themselves are are incredibly oppressed and uh, by Hamas and being used as as human shields. And we want to pray for the soldiers, for for uh, our own family, my a grandson, a son-in-law. Uh, almost every family has someone who's in uniform. This is this is uh, the, the entire country is responding, um, and and to pray for a quick a quick and and sharp and clear victory in the destruction uh, of these uh, of these Hamas forces. We want to pray against Hezbollah, uh, a, a massive attack on the northern border in 2006. Uh, we absorbed 3,600 rockets right in our area. We were running for bomb shelters, and um, we, we don't really want to do that again. We need to pray against a multi-front war, uh, and, and, and just this is, this is where it's at. And we know that God has called you, according to Isaiah 62, to be watchmen on the wall. So I want to close this time, as I've been asked by Pastor Jeff, to close it. I want to close it with the ironic benediction for Numbers chapter 6. It says, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face and shine upon you. May the Lord uh, uh, cause you to experience his, his shalom, his peace, as he is gracious uh, toward you. And I'll sing it in Hebrew. Yivarechecha Adonai, Vaishmarecha, Yair Adonai Panavelecha, Vihuneka, Isa Adonai Panavelecha, Beasem Lecha, Shalom. We thank you with all of our hearts. Thank you for standing with us. God be with you and be with us together as we learn to walk together in this amazing brotherhood in our Messiah, Jesus. I don't want anybody to feel any uh, compulsion here. I, I need you to be led of the Spirit. Our, our men, our deacons are preparing with baskets. I told you when I did the teaching online that we we're going to be receiving a special offering. I didn't know at that time uh, the desperation that Anton and those in the Israel would be experiencing. I just knew the Lord said you need to take an offering. If you're not prepared to give today, don't worry about that. But if, if the Spirit's spoken to your heart, everything going in these baskets, none of this is staying here. Every bit of this 50 cents out of every dollar is going to Anton to help do whatever he needs. He's got a grandson. He's got a brother, a son-in-law. Can you imagine how many students over 30 years he's raised up that are now about to enter into Gaza that will not come home? 
that just need basic necessities. That's where this money, 50 cents out of every dollar you put in that basket is going to help him help them. The other 50 cents is going to Samaritan's Purse with Dr. Graham because I don't know of a ministry out of America that does a better job getting the maximum. They can get out of a dime, they can get 12 cents. And they're boots on the ground right now. They are in Israel preparing meals, meeting needs, sharing Jesus with the Jews. So that's how this offering is going to go. If you can give, put something in. If you need to go home and pray about it, you can, you can check with our executive pastor, Pastor Richie, later on. You can do something. Just designate it out. It's all going to go to one of those two places. We're going, we're going to just put it down the middle. Now, how many of you got your cross? How many of you got your cross? Here's what I want you to do. This is an olive wood cross. The Bible says that we've been grafted into the olive tree. Olive tree is a picture of, of Israel. We got grafted in through the gospel. <laughs> Paul and Trish Scott, who are part of our church family, shared something with me, and it'll be on all of our social media. Pastor Jonathan's going to make sure it's on everything that Fairview's got. There's a website called Firm, F-I-R-M, Israel, I-S-R-A-E-L.com. Firm Israel, Firm Israel, dot com. No, it's dot org. It's dot org. It's dot org. You're fired. Um, <laughs> dot org. Don't worry, I do that eight times a day. <laughs> .org. When you go on there, it has the names of every hostage that has not come home. Of every son, every daughter, every granddaughter, every grandson, every little infant, every 80-something-year-old grandma. How mean do you have to be to drag an 80-something-year-old grandmother out of her house and stick her in a tunnel? All their names are on that, firmisrael.org. What Chris and I have done is we've written that on one side, and then today we're going to pick out a couple of names, and we're going to write those names under this verse, Isaiah 49, 16, for I have carved you in the palm of my hand. And we're going to, we're going to keep this with us. Now, some of you, I'll be candid, you don't have a conviction about this. Maybe, maybe God hadn't touched your heart, and you're still vacillating. I, I preacher, I don't know about this. Then I would encourage you as a believer I'd take this and I, I'd, I'd claim a verse over a son, a daughter, a granddaughter, grandson, a husband, a wife, that if we don't get back here next Sunday because we go home, I'd put their name on this cross. And I wouldn't let this thing out of my sight to remind me every day. Because, Lord, if you come to get us, they're left behind. And I'd ask God for their soul. And I'd ask God to give me a chance to go sit down and say to them, do you understand how late it is. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for the receptive heart of this church. I know that many pastors would wish in their hearts that they could preach something so controversial and yet at the same time biblically convicting. I pray those men of God just take the helm and Accept the consequences. Our nation needs leather-lunged men of God to stand up and sound the alarm. Put on the heart of your people what to give. Put on the heart of your people who to pray for. And in the days to come, may you rejoice over this faith family because we've yielded to the truth of your word that you have a plan for Israel. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand, beloved? Uh, our servants are getting the baskets across. You do as the Spirit says. Altar's open. Pastor Mike's leading. You come as God's calling. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love through the stone he is Lord Lord 
There's a song we've sung here before. Um, Eric, can you pull up the words for the blessing? The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Oh, that's the one. Sing it one more time. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. And keep you, make his face shine upon you, and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you, and give you peace. Mm -mm -mm. Through many dangers, toil. I have already come Tis grace that brought me safe <laughs> And grace me sing uh give me let's i want to sing uh the the last verse of it is well and lord haste the day when my faith shall be signed your hands together and let those around you know. Hallelujah. Oh, my, my, my. What a day. What a day. If you're a guest today for the first time, in just a few seconds, we're going to ask you to make your way out the connection, this, this door right here to the connection point. Meet our pastor. He has a gift. would love to meet you. And then finally, as you go out, if you're a member here, uh, don't forget to give to the Lord as God has prospered you. God bless you. You're dismissed.